I'm the new guy getting used to this traffic. And then, of course, it seems like there's always a new adventure. Um, nevertheless, God is good. We made it. So for that, I'm thankful. We're going to prepare ourselves to delve right into our study. We are still dealing with the theme of how to study the Bible. How to study the Bible. We saw yesterday the great importance of the preparation as well as the theme of the Bible. And you're going to find that as we go forward in our studies, you're going to see why the preparation and the theme are incredibly important. And now as we're preparing to now jump into the method, tonight we're dealing with the method. What is the method of Bible study? Is there a science? And we're going to go ahead and look at that tonight. So before we do that, let's bow for a word of prayer. And as much as we're able to, if you can, let's kneel together as we begin. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for the blessings of life, health, and strength. Father, we thank you that even trials come our way because you told us that tribulations work patience and patience experience and experience hope. And so, Father, we can even look at the challenges of our lives and see your blessings in it and truly say that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands at this time. We want to be equipped to be workers in your vineyard so that we may go forward to finish your work in this generation. And, Lord, it cannot be done by simple might or power, but only by your spirit. And so, Father, we ask you to first forgive us of our sins and that you will also send your Holy Spirit, that he may come and teach us and open our eyes and help us to behold wondrous things out of thy law. And, Father, I thank you that you have heard this prayer, and I trust that you have answered it, for we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, <clears throat> Last night, we finished off our class where we were talking about how to study the Bible, or specifically, the principle of study. That was the last text we looked at last night was 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And we saw that the Bible tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which tells us that there is a wrong way to divide the words of truth. Amen? Amen? All right. So because of that reality, it becomes important for us to understand God's principles of the right means of dividing his word of truth. And therefore, one of the most popular texts of scripture that help us with this is the book of Isaiah 28. In Isaiah the 28th chapter, uh, many theologians, Sister White herself, and many, many others, they have found that in Isaiah 28 is a formula on how to study the Bible, more importantly, how to rightly divide the words of truth. And you'll see that in Isaiah 28, there's several things that is happening in Isaiah 28. When you look at it carefully, I want you to notice what's, what's going on here. Isaiah, the 28th chapter, and when you get there, just let me know by saying amen. <coughs> now, in Isaiah 28, let, let's look carefully starting from verse 1. In Isaiah 28 and verse 1, let's notice what the Bible says. This is, this is very important. It says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. Now, Ephraim was one of the tribes of Israel. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we're seeing that there's clearly an issue with e Ephraim as we look at verse uh, four, 3. And what was the issue? The crown, of pride. crown of pride. We see that pride was definitely an issue. Now, it goes on to say, and the glorious beauty, verse 4, and the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. It says, in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory for, and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of people and for a spirit of judgment. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn to the battle to the gate. But they also have erred. So somebody else also messed up like who? Okay, so it says, but they also have erred. Now, look at what it says as it relates to those who have erred. It says, but they also have erred through what? 
through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Now look at who the Bible specifically highlights were the ones who became drunk with wine. It says the who? The priest, the priest and who else? Now is that a problem? The key way that God would give his instructions to his people was through the priests and the prophets. But now we find in the scripture that both the priests and the prophet, the typical mouthpieces of God, the mediators, the ones that would go ahead and stand in the presentation of Christ to give forth the things of God and offer gifts and sacrifices, the very prophets, the ones who were called seers, they were supposed to be the ones that would have that prophetic insight. These individuals are now drunk. Well, let's look at what it says. It says, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Serious problems. As a result of this, it says, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Everywhere is dirty. Therefore, God asks a question in verse 9. It says, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine it says them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast now in our later studies we're going to break down this verse because whom shall he teach knowledge you literally have to pick at that verse who is the he what is knowledge what is understanding? What does it mean to be weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? Those are going to be questions that you'll be getting on a test. So you're going to need to understand when you go through these verses. I'm not going to let anybody in this class assume they know what's right. God wants you to know what's right. In Great Controversy, page 598, we're told we have a chart that points out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we do not have to guess at anything. You don't have to guess. You can know but you're going to have to know how to go through the scriptures. So therefore, God asks all these questions. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? The answer, those who are weaned from the milk, those who are drawn from the breast. And now notice what the Bible gives as a formula, as a formula for those that he will teach knowledge, those that he will make to understand doctrine. The formula in verse 10 says for what? Precept. Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So you'll find that the Bible is introducing a situation. Here's the situation. Israel was supposed to be in a favored position with God. Israel was supposed to understand the things of God. Unfortunately, they went astray <coughs> and they began to fall short. One of the key reasons we see why they fell short is because of what, according to what we read so far? Pride, definitely, and what else? What was very foundational? Strong drink, right? Now, we know that there's a literal application. But then there's also a spiritual application. The Bible says in the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So wine has a spiritual implication as well as a literal. Now, who else was drunk? The prophets and the priests. You see, at least if the prophets and priests are sober, then they can help redirect the common people. But when the prophet and the priest are drunk, and then the people are drunk, naturally, the question is, how are the people going to learn knowledge now? How are they going to learn knowledge? How are they going to understand doctrine? It identifies those who will, those who are weaned from the milk, those who are drawn from the breast. Why? Because precept must be upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of these steps here because you're going to find that these steps are going to be very key when it comes to how to study the Bible as it relates to a method. How can we get to the point that we have knowledge? How can we get to the point that we can understand doctrine? Well, we're going to have to start understanding precept upon precept. We're going to have to start understanding line upon line. We're going to need to understand here a little and there a little. And you'll find that these verses or these statements in the verses do not all necessarily mean the same thing. 
An example, precept. Let's start with precept. Precept is very important. What is a precept? A precept is what? How do we know that? <laughs> That's called cheating. <laughs> now, you will notice that precept, what you would do is this. Now, you didn't have to bring it tonight. I'm telling you this. You're going to need to bring with you. I'm going to tell you what you need to bring at the conclusion of our class on Sunday. All right? But what you would do is anytime you run into these words, precept or whatever, you're going to take your concordance out. Is that one of your tools? Yeah. Yes. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that concordance out and you're going to start looking up the word precept. And you're going to find out, well, what is the original word? Where does this word also come up in the Bible? And I got an example. Go to the book of Hosea and we're going to go to chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 11. Hosea chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 11. Now watch this, because there's another word that comes up for precept. Electronic concordances are especially helpful with this. While it is true that the book concordances are good, um, electronic concordances are, are very helpful. If you all have these things called smartphones, make that thing use its brain. You can go ahead and put all sorts of free software on your phones and on your iPods, iPads, tablets, and all these other things, and you can actually put concordances on them, and you can actually start looking up words in the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Aramaic. It's very easy. Now, what would happen is if you look up the word precept, you're going to see a word come up called command, as my sister clearly pointed out. But in addition to that, what I like about the electronic concordances, it will also show you other areas in the Bible where that same word is used. That's very important in Bible study. So now, it would take us to Hosea 5 and verse 11. Now let's notice what Hosea 5 and verse 11 says, and let's notice the different language that's used here. Hosea 5, and we're looking at verse 11. The Bible says, Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the what? Commandment. Commandment. The very exact word for precept is also translated in another place, Hosea 5, as commandment. So therefore, a precept is what? Commandment. A commandment. Very good. Now, watch this. A precept is a commandment. So therefore, if you want to know the formula for how to study the Bible, the Bible said in Isaiah 28, it said right there in verse 10, it says for what? Precept must be what? Upon precept. So now we understand that that commandment must be compared with commandment. This is a method of how to study the Bible. When you look at one command from God, you can say, all right, I see that command there, but let me compare it with other commands that God has said in other places of the Bible. And when you do that, that's where you're going to find the harmony of truth. Watch this. You remember I shared that story with you of that gentleman when I came to the church, Church of Christ. And when I went to the Church of Christ, this gentleman began to share with me Matthew 22. Let's go to Matthew 22. Let's watch this. When we go to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, this is the text of Scripture that he was using. Now, in Matthew 22, you'll notice in the closing uh, verses there, Matthew 22, and we're going to look at verses 36 to 40. Look at what the brother did. You see, what this gentleman did was not altogether wrong. But nevertheless, it was certainly not altogether right. Look at what it says in Matthew 22, and we're going to start at verse 36. Watch this. In Matthew 22, 36, it says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So this gentleman wants to talk about what? Commandments. 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 He says, which is the great commandment in the law? So he wants to know what's the greatest of the commandments. Now it says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang how much? All, all the law and the prophets. So he read that. And his natural interpretation of that verse was that these must be new commandments. 
So the Bible never said it. The Bible never said new, but he added that thought in there. Because of the fact that Jesus was giving a summarization of the commandments by saying, on this hang all the law and the prophets, his interpretation of that was, that means all the law and the prophets are done away with, and these are the new commandments that now exist. So he's looking at a command from Jesus. This is a clear command that Jesus is telling us. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he was following that, but the problem was is he did not compare command with command. If he would have done that, he would have seen, well, wait a minute, is this command nullifying or voiding out the other commandments? No, it's actually in harmony with it. And we saw, because all you got to do is if you go there to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, you remember that in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, it said it right there. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. What you do is you compare that with the other commands. You show other areas in the Bible to say, wait, wait a minute. Those commands were also given when God's Ten Commandments were still binding upon his people. Here it is that in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, you have the love God commandment, of which he thought was new. But then also he had the Leviticus 19, 18, which also showed that God says, Love your neighbor. So therefore, when he missed this, Satan took advantage of the opportunity to misdirect his mind. And as a result of that, he was taken off track. He was taken off course, and unfortunately, the enemy was having fun with his thought processes until God allowed him to come in contact with truth. And so it is that you'll find that when we study the Bible, you don't want to look at just one command God says here and then go ahead and run with it. What you must do is you compare commands with commands. Where are the other areas in the Bible that God has also given commandments that are similar to this one I'm reading here? I think it's in 1 John. Is it in 1 John? What are you referring to exactly? Uh, What's the thought? If you tell me the thought, maybe I can help you. About loving, um, loving God. Yes, that's 1 John chapter 5. Look at 1 John 5. Let's see if, let me know if that's it. 1 John 5, and more than likely we're talking about verse 4. If you look at 1 John chapter 5, oh yes, verse, uh, verse 3, you let me know. Is this what it's talking about? Where it says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous? No, that wasn't the one. Okay, so you were thinking something else. About being a liar, if you say you know God. In chapter 2, it's, it's, it's kind of right here. It says in chapter 2, verse 7, uh, it says, Brethren, I write you no new commandment. Um, brethren, I write you no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye have heard, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which things is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past, and the true light is now, sh now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's kind of like it. Yeah, I mean, it, it brings it out. It brings out the very similar point as well. Right. It's a good text to use. What you'll learn is this. When individuals present an argument to you, what you want to do is deal directly with the argument as much as possible. When you find that you have to bring up a verse and then you got to explain, 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 sometimes the people get lost in all that explanation and now you got to work your way all the way back to the original argument. Okay. That's why you'll notice I like to cut arguments very short. Now that's, that's counsel. You read in, counsel, in the book Counsels to Writers and Editors, it actually tells us that when we deal with arguments, deal with the opposing points as quickly as possible. Don't give a lot of points in different texts because it could take us off. As an example, you remember last night, uh, Brother Chin Lee, when he shared with us the uh, Holy Spirit represents the breath of life. Remember that? That, by the way, to a degree is true. But here's where it can create. And this is how you got to think when you're having Bible discussions. If you say the Holy Spirit represents the breath of life, then what's going to happen is you can find yourself running into trouble. Here's the trouble you can run into. 
if the person is studious, they're going to go to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 15, where they see that every creature that died in the flood, the Bible literally says every creature that had the breath of life in it. So that means that, are you saying every fish and every cow had the Holy Spirit in it? You get that? You see that point? So even though that's an excellent point that he brings out, but at the same time, there are other ways that that point can be applied, and then what can happen is it can create longer arguments that's going to push you away from the original argument that you're trying to deal with. Do you understand that point? So that's a very key thing when you're doing how to study the Bible. You want to make sure that you can say, hey, you know what, let me deal with it as pinpointed as I can. I remember I was at a, 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 a college called Atlantic Union College, and I was doing a week of prayer there. And when I did the week of prayer, um, the Lord really blessed. But then what happened, someone said, Brother Lemon, there's a man who would like to meet with you. And I said, okay. And I met with this gentleman, and when he sat down with me, he said he used to be a seven-day Adventist. Used to be a seven-day Adventist. And he said he's now a Baptist. And I said, okay. And I said, well, tell me why. And he said, well, the problem that I have with Adventism is he says, when I read the Bible, I could read several places in the Bible where it shows that God will judge the wicked. But he says, but I can find nowhere in the Bible where God will judge the righteous. That was his issue. He said, Seventh-day Adventists believe that both the righteous and the wicked come up in the judgment. He says, but everywhere I read in the Bible that God deals with judgment, he says, it constantly shows that God is going to judge the wicked. He says, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God says he will judge the righteous. Well, what I did was I said, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Then what you're telling me is that if you saw somewhere in the Bible where God will judge the righteous, you would change your position. I said, is that correct? <laughs> now, you know how we do this, right? You ask questions because you know you already got it somewhere. So I said, so are you telling me that? He says, oh, yes, I would change. But he says, but I know there's nowhere in the Bible that says that. Now, you know where the average Seventh-day Adventist would go? They would go to 1 Peter chapter 4, where it says judgment must begin where? At the house of God. But do you know what? If he's studious, if he's studious, he would just say, well, that's true. Judgment begins at the house of God. But Matthew 24, verses 44 to 51, shows very clearly that there will be both wicked and righteous people in the house of God. So therefore, judgment begins at the house of God with the wicked. He could have used that argument. So therefore, you have to say, is there anywhere in the Bible where God directly says he will judge the righteous? Is there anywhere in the Bible that says that? Is there? Yes? Since you said yes, where is it? <laughs> I took him to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 17. Why don't you turn there? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 17, you tell me if this is a clear text that shuts down the argument immediately. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 17. Who could read that for us nice and loud? What does it say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 17? Tell me if, it's, if this is not clear as broad daylight. What is the Bible? Remember, his argument was there is nowhere in the Bible that God says he will judge the righteous. That was his issue. He literally left the Seventh-day Adventist church because he felt we were teaching false doctrine, talking about righteous people going to judgment as well. But notice now, what does Ecclesiastes 3.17 say? I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. There is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Is that clear? Yes. That literally ends the argument. So therefore, as I shared that with him, he was absolutely flustered. He said, you know what? I've never seen this before. I said, I can assure you, it was always there. <laughs> always there. Never moved. But what happened was... Unfortunately, he was not sincere in his study. When I showed him that, I was hoping he would have been like the other gentleman at the Church of Christ, but he refused to talk to me anymore. He, he got up from the table, and he walked away and said, I don't want to discuss this anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It's a witness. Remember, the Bible says that we must preach the gospel for a witness. So that means not everybody will accept it, but unfortunately, a time is going to come that if we continue to reject truth, that it will come back to us. And God is going to say, the truth was witness to you, brother, and you didn't accept it. 
because you prefer to reject. Remember Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, God says, I will reject thee. So therefore, when people reject knowledge, it's a very dangerous place to be. And so you'll find that when you study the Bible with people, they'll bring up all sorts of arguments. So step number one is that compare precept with precept. If they say God commanded that we forgive, then you want to go ahead and show other areas in the Bible and see is it harmonious or is it not? If someone says God commanded that we take vengeance, then you want to go ahead and find out are there other areas in the Bible that speak in harmony with it or against it. Whatever it may be, whatever position you hold, whatever commands of God that you and I claim that we follow, you want to make sure, is it harmonious throughout Scripture? Because let me show you something about God's commandments. Go to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, this is why you really want to be careful when you're comparing command with command. In Psalm 119, notice what the Bible says as we consider verse 196. Psalm 119 96. Psalm 119, 96. Why we should be careful to compare when comparing command, command with command? Because you're about to see, according to Psalm 119, 96, a very important point. In Psalm 119, 96, it, it brings out a principle about God's commandments. Notice what it says. It says in Psalm 119, 96, I'll read this one in your hearing. It says, I have seen an end of all perfection... But thy commandments are exceeding what? Broad. broad. Another word for broad is deep. God's commandments are very deep. God's commandments have several layers. When Jesus came to the earth, notice what he did in Isaiah 42. This is an example of God's commandments being deep. Go to Isaiah 42. In Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, watch what the Bible says. Isaiah 42, this is actually a uh, prophecy about Jesus and the work that he was going to do. Isaiah 42, and we're going to go ahead and look at verse 21. Isaiah 42 and verse 21. Notice what the Bible says. It says in Isaiah 42 and verse 21, speaking about Jesus, it says, The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. What will he do with the law? He will magnify it and make it what? Honorable. That verse, Isaiah 42, 21, if you were the kind of person that marked your Bible, you would want to mark Psalm 1996 with Isaiah 42, 21. If you're the kind of person who marks your Bible, they make the same point. God says, thy commandments are exceeding broad. Isaiah 42, 21 shows how Jesus was going to do that. He was going to magnify it. He was going to show the deeper layer of God's commandments. Where did Jesus do that? Exactly. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 27, 28, you'll remember that Jesus did something that was very powerful. Go there with me. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You remember Jesus? He revealed layers. He started to peel away on the commandments, so he wanted the people to really understand what was being said. Look at what it says here. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. This is an example of magnifying the law. This is an example of God's law being broad or deep. The Bible says in Isaiah, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, verses 27 to 28. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But now look at the layer. Look at the magnification. Look at how Jesus broadens it. He says in verse 28, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to do what? Lust after her hath already committed adultery in his heart. That's an example of taking the command and magnifying it. So the first thing you want to do is you want to compare command with command when you're studying the precept principle. Secondly, you want to magnify it. Think about it. Tithe and offering. Is that what God wants us to do? Yes. yes. Is it a sin if I don't do it? Yes? yes? yes, yes. Are you sure? Y'all yes, yes, yes. yeah, don't look like you're sure. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. The Bible says you are cursed. I mean, that, that's pretty clear. Now, watch this. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God and, Fear God and, keep, his Fear God and keep his commandments. Is that right? 
That's the whole duty of man. So the whole duty of man could be found right there in the commandments of God. Yes? Yes? So where are you going to find thou, uh, thou shalt return tithe and offering in the Ten Commandments? Where do you find that? You see that? See, so what's happening is there's a broadening. There's a making it more clear. For many people, they don't return tithe and offering because they trust their money more than they trust God. And whoever you trust, that is your God. So there are many individuals who don't return tithe and offering because they have another God in their life and they don't even realize it. They have an idol in their life. They don't even realize it. So therefore, they are coveting. Do you get it? So you can literally look at these commands, all these different things that God has said that's also called sin, but it's not directly spelled out in the Ten Commandments. Dress reform. Is dress something that we deal with? Is dress, is dress a very sensitive and serious topic? Can a person sin by the way they dress? Can a person sin by the way they eat and drink? Yes, so, so the, but some people will say, where's that in the Ten Commandments? And the only way you can answer that is when you understand Psalm 1996 and Isaiah 42, 21, you must magnify. Think about it. And study. That, study to show yourself approved. And that's how you magnify, because you're not going to magnify if you don't study. Now watch this. Think about this. If an individual, uh, if God will condemn a man for looking at a woman and lusting after her, can we peel another layer? Would not God condemn the woman then who dresses in a manner that causes men to look and lust? Yes. Do you see that? So then could foul dress fall under the seventh commandment? Commandment number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. If God says adultery is not just touching, but adultery is also looking and lusting, <laughs> then that means that then God is also going to condemn that woman when she goes in front of the mirror and she knows that this is designed to stimulate lustful thought. So God says, that's a sin too. Do you get that? So that's what I mean when the Bible says, thy commandments are exceeding broad, they're very deep, the commandment must be magnified, you must help the people see. Not just the surface statement, but the deeper layers as well. So number one, you compare command with command. Once you compare command with command, magnify it. Look at the deeper layers. What is this commandment really teaching me? What is this commandment really teaching the person that I'm talking with? This is powerful study, powerful study. If you learn this, if by the grace of God you master this, you will get to a point that you will find that you can really be a gem in the hands of God in ministering to others and presenting to them truth as it is in Jesus. Compa compare command with command. Next up was line. In Isaiah 28, there was also a line. Now, what, what is a line? What is that? A line. A line is a line. <laughs> so you say it's a line. line, line you, we learn a very different lesson from line, from line than we do from precept. I love line. Line is, line is perhaps what saved my life, spiritually speaking. I, I, I'm dead serious about it. Because if there's one thing that is true that you will find that you can fall into in Seventh-day Adventism is something called fanaticism. It's a very easy trap. We have many extremes that we could fall into. God has given us living principles, education principles, dress principles, diet principles, all these different principles, but we can take these principles that are designed to be a blessing and we can allow it to become a curse by going into extremes. What does the line help us do? Well, if you were to go ahead and look up the word line, once again, you'll find that another place it shows up is in the book of Isaiah, and we're going to go to Isaiah 44. In Isaiah, the 44th uh, chapter, you will find that there's some lessons we learn as it relates to the line. And this is very, very important when studying scripture. I've, I've, boy, I tell you, this is a very valuable tool. Isaiah 44. And we're going to look at verse 13. Isaiah 44 and verse 13. We're talking about the line right now. Isaiah 44. 
verse 13. I want you to look at this. This is a very powerful principle. Look at this. Isaiah 44 and verse 13. Are we there? It says in verse 13, The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. Now, the word rule is the same word for line. The word rule is the same word for line. And who's using this? A carpenter. So this is something that the carpenter uses to measure things. All right? He's using a rule. Today we will call it a ruler. Okay? Rule, ruler, same thing. All right? Now look at this. He says, the carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He, <coughs> he marketeth out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and make it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. So you'll find that here it is that the line here is being referred to a rule or ruler. A rule or a ruler, what do you use it for? Measure. To measure things. Very good. And why do you use it to, what, what, are you what are you trying to do when you measure things? You're trying to make sure that it's what? Ah, I love that word. That it's accurate. Very good. How about balanced? Did you catch that? So in other words, when somebody tries to teach or when you're studying, you want to make sure that whatever you're learning, it must be balanced and accurate. It must be balanced. You see, what is the great issue with people who suffer or struggle with fanaticism or extremes? They are usually unbalanced. Is that right? In other words, they might be biblical, but they're unbalanced in being biblical. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you a good example. Go to Psalm 95. Let, let's look at this one. Let, I'm going to use this example. Psalms 95. Somebody's uh, perusing the Bible and they go to Psalm 95 and they discover something. Let's look at this. Yeah, this is a good one. Now, in Psalm 95... Let's say somebody's studying the Bible and they want to specifically study on the topic of prayer posture. Well, they're studying Psalm 95 and they get to Psalm 95 and verse 6. When they get to Psalms 95 and verse 6, let's notice what the Bible says here. Psalms 95 and verse 6, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us do what? Kneel. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Well, somebody reads that and they say, well, the Bible says to bow down, and more specifically, to bow down is to kneel. So therefore they say, well, the Bible says that I have to kneel. So everywhere they go, and every time they pray, they begin to kneel. Well, I remember a friend of mine, um, you know, he was at a grocery store, and he was talking to a lady. He loved to witness and tell everybody about Jesus. So as he was in this grocery store, he began to talk to the sister, and as he talked with her, he was witnessing to her, telling her about God, and she was receptive. So it got to a point that as he was witnessing to her, eventually he said, would you like for me to pray with you? And she was like, right here, right now? In a grocery store full of people walking by? He says, yes, 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 we can pray right now. So she was like, I guess so. And then he said, all right, come, come. And he starts trying to lead her down to kneel. How do you think that lady responded? You're crazy. <laughs> Gone. He began coming to church, and, 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 and there were different times and different places and situations where there was kneeling. Uh, people were not kneeling when they prayed. And all of a sudden, he was, he was condemning, boy. I tell you, he was pulling out all the guns of the word of God. And he was just shooting and firing away and condemning everybody because they wouldn't kneel. At every time, he said that when he would get in his car, he would roll the seat back so he can kneel in the car and to give God thanks. So what happened was he read one verse. Did the verse say that we should come before God and kneel? Yes, he did. But the problem was is that it was not a balanced research. It was not a ba or accurate research. He did see where the verse said that, but what he missed was Nehemiah. Go to the book of Nehemiah. When you go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, I believe it's actually Nehemiah 2. Let's see. Nehemiah 1 or 2. Yeah, 2. Nehemiah 2. When you look at Nehemiah chapter 2, look, look right here at verse 1.
When you look at Nehemiah chapter uh, 2, notice what it says right here in verse 1. Nehemiah 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very what? So afraid. Now, please understand what's happening here. Nehemiah is standing right in front of the king. They're having a discussion. The king is looking at Nehemiah, and the king is saying, what's going on with your look, your face? You literally look sad. What's the matter with you? Nehemiah is now timid. He's afraid because this is something he didn't necessarily want to be seen, but nevertheless, it's clearly obvious. Look at how he responds now in verse 3. And said unto king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Look at what it says in verse 4. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? In other words, what would you like for me to do? What did Nehemiah do? The Bible says, So then, so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king. Now, brothers and sisters, did Nehemiah kneel when he did this? He's standing right before the king. The king says, what do you want? Nehemiah shoots up an SOS prayer. And he says, Lord, help me in this situation. And then he says, well, king. And he goes ahead and he addresses the king. Did God hear Nehemiah's prayer? Was his people's kingdom restored? Of course it was. So therefore, we find that God answered that prayer, but Nehemiah did not Neil, how about the man who was the publican? You remember there was the story in the, in the Gospels of, the, of uh, the Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee came, oh Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not like these wicked publicans. But then the publican, what did the Bible say the publican did? It says he bowed his head and beat upon his chest and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, what? A sinner. Did he kneel? He did not kneel. Did God hear his prayer? Jesus said that man walked away justified. And so you'll find that there are times and places where it is appropriate to kneel, and then there are times and places where it will not be necessary, yea, practical. If you are climbing up a ladder, <laughs> you probably would not want to kneel, especially if it's a windy day. That's right. It, did, you see them, did you see those little smart cars, uh, those things? I mean, it looks almost like, I mean, they make me laugh every time I see them. Because I'm just, I just can't believe anybody would drive in that thing. I, I wouldn't even feel comfortable in a car like that. But, I mean, wh when you pray, are you going to get out the car and get on the asphalt and kneel? Or are you going to sit in the car and ask God to be with you as you prepare to go on your journey? Ellen White says that in public and private worship, it is our privilege and our duty to kneel before God in prayer. In public and private worship, it is our privilege and our duty to kneel before God in prayer. But if it is not public or private worship, and there are different circumstances and situations, then it may not be appropriate, yea, a requirement of God for us to kneel. So therefore, it's amazing how someone can take a verse from the Bible and then they could go ahead and say, well, this is what we're supposed to do. Think about it. Before sin, what was man's diet? Fruits, nuts, All right. Now watch this. There, there are some people who will say, by my study of the Bible, the beginning, man's diet was fruits, grains, and nuts. No vegetables. <laughs> And that's true. Before sin, vegetables was not in man's diet. Genesis 3, 18, which is after sin, that's when vegetables were introduced. That's when God literally added vegetables into the diet. So therefore, before sin, fruits, grains, nuts, that was man's diet. Once man fell into sin, God added the vegetable kingdom. 
Now, of course, when we begin to do research, you'll find that typically fruits are good for cleansing and vegetables are typically good for healing. And once man fell into sin, there was obviously some challenges, so therefore God added the vegetable kingdom because it certainly has plenty. The herbal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom has plenty of healing virtues. Yes, sister. I don't follow why the, like, when the devotional part of the, the Genesis 1, 29, uh, like the devotional part of Genesis 129. Because you see it in Genesis 3.18. Seed. So it gives you plant, it doesn't mean only fruit, it gives you plant, meaning... How do, how do you typically differentiate a fruit from a vegetable? Seeds. Seeds. Right, so like pepper, is it a fruit or vegetable? What's that? Pepper. Is it a fruit or vegetable? It's a fruit. Tomatoes are fruit. Olives are fruit. Cucumbers are fruit. Avocado is a fruit. But that's what they call vegetable. Yeah, I know, because we're ignorant. But the Bible, see, if we follow what the scripture says, we're fine. The scripture, re really, I'm serious when I say, you know, ignorant is not to be an insulting word. Ignorant means you don't know something. You're like, it's a lack of knowledge. We don't know something. I'm ignorant on a ton of things in life. So that's all it is. We, we say that out of ignorance. We just don't know. But quite honestly, these things that have seeds in it, this is what represents fruit. It doesn't always have to be sweet. It, by the way, almost everything has sugar content. Everything has sugar content. When we grow uh, even lettuce, if you take lettuce and you squeeze it enough where a drop of the juice falls out of the lettuce, you put it on a refractometer and look at it, you'll see there's a sugar content in there. So therefore, everything has sugar in it, even though it may not taste sweet. But we'll get to that. When we get to med the medical missionary training and we get to understanding food and its medicinal properties, we'll go ahead and get you know, more sharp and succinct when it comes to understanding food and what is this and what is that. Most people say that corn is a vegetable. I grew up most of my life thinking corn was a vegetable. I found out recently corn is a grain. Most people think peanuts are nuts. Peanuts are actually beans, legumes. So you, you, you get what I'm saying? So seriously, so a lot of people, we just don't know because we grew up always hearing it like this. So I perfectly understand. But again, that's just our ignorance. But God comes to give us knowledge. He comes to give us light. Amen? Amen. So so it is that you'll find that the vegetable kingdom comes into the picture. But if somebody says, well, if God wants to restore everything back to the original, then that means that we should go ahead and start having a fruit, grain, nut diet and get rid of the vegetables. Is that an accurate or balanced understanding? No, it is not. Does the Bible show that we will be eating vegetables, even in the new heaven and the new earth? What do you say? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you eat, when you eat lettuce, is, is lettuce a vegetable? Now, it has what on it? Lettuce has what? Leaves. Is that right? So one of the signs of a vegetable is that it has those what? Those leaves. Is that, does the Bible talk about some leaves from a tree yes. and that people are going to be eating it yes. in the new heaven and the new earth? Yes. So will mankind be eating the ve vegetables? Yes. yes. <laughs> so what is it then? It's a vegetable. A herb is a vegetable. But it's a vegetable. It's a vegetable. It's a vegetable. You can't refute that. You can't refute that. It's a vegetable. Mm -mm, can't get away from that one. So it is that you'll find... So do you understand now? Do you see why it would be a fanatical position for someone to say fruit, grain, nuts? We're trying to go back to the original. We're getting back to the restoration. So therefore, no more vegetables. That's not balanced. That's not accurate. And so you'll find that you'll hear people talk about all sorts of things. Some people talk about, oh, we got to go back to the feast days. And they use one quote or a few quotes to a couple of Bible verses. But then you go ahead and say, well, let's look at the balance of what Scripture says about the feast days. Let's look at what the balance of what the Spirit of Prophecy says about feast days. Some people will say, you know what, you need to start observing a 2,520-year prophecy. And they'll go ahead and they'll start pushing that thing real strong. But then all you got to do is say, well, let's look at the balance of prophecy. Oh, Ellen White said that it must be on the chart. And Ellen White spoke highly of the chart. Ellen White said that W.W. Simpson's charts was the best system of charts she ever saw, and W.W. Simpson's charts, which I have a copy of, have no 2520 on it. So what do I do with that now? You get what I'm saying? 
So people can make statements. They'll find a gem in the Bible. They'll find a gem in the spirit of prophecy, and then they'll run with it and sometimes make whole doctrines out of it. Why? Because they were not faithfully following line upon line. That's why, number one, precept upon precept. Compare command with command. Line, you have to make sure that it is balanced and accurate. Brothers and sisters, beware of fanaticism. It comes after us in a very forceful manner. And you all are especially the target because Seventh-day Adventists are typically prone and almost inclined to go into the direction of fanaticism because we have so many reform messages. We must guard. Following so far? Good. We'll take, all right, we're doing good on time, one and then two. Go ahead, Sister Regina and then Sister Hall. As I'm going through my study and I'm using my electronic concordance, yes. if I'm looking up line, I get several scriptures that come out. So is my study, is my job to go through everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes. You're going to find that true Bible study requires something we hate, effort. Seriously, because we, th let me tell you something. I love the writings of Ellen White. I really do. In case you haven't noticed, I love the writings of Sister White. They're a blessing to us. It's a gift. But watch this. I notice one of the things that we find a lot of Seventh-day Adventists do. They almost explain every position they believe through the writings of Sister White. And you ask them, where is it in the Bible? Well, I don't know, but Sister White said it. Oh, are you saying you don't believe the prophet? And all of a, you know, they try to turn it around. <laughs> oh, you saying you don't believe? Oh, you're apostate. And they, they do all that stuff because they are ignorant of what the Bible says. So we'll find that sometimes it's easier to just say, well, Sister White said it because Sister White did all the homework. <laughs> we have a natural tendency in our human nature to lean on the people who already did the homework so it can make our job easy. That's the American way. And so you'll find that to truly study, you have to go back. You have to go back. You have to start looking again and saying, okay, what do I really believe? Why do I really believe this? Where is it in the Bible? I understand Sister White says it. Amen. But I got, a, I got a witness to a whole lot of people that have no idea who Ellen G. White is and do not respect her writings as an authority. So granted, I want to understand it from the prophet because even 1 Corinthians 14 says that prophecy is for those who believe. Amen. It's for those who believe. So if you claim to be a believer, now what I don't apologize to is when somebody says I'm a seven-day Adventist, and then I go ahead and tell them, well, here's what the prophet says, and all of a sudden they say, well, show me from the Bible. Now when I hear that stuff, I'm like, look, did you lie or did you tell the truth at the pool? Did you lie or did you tell the truth? You stood at the pool. Hopefully, the minister said, do you accept that this is the remnant church of Bible prophecy? And that God has given to this church the gift of prophecy as manifested through the writings of Ellen White. Now, we know that Satan has had his hand even in some of our vows. That today, sometimes it, our vows have become very abstract when back in the days it used to be very succinct, very, very specific. People were literally, you know, a person couldn't be baptized if they wore jewelry? No baptism. And that included wedding bands. All of that jewelry had to come off. That was understood years ago. Today, a lot of this stuff got gray. And it's not that the word of God got gray. Our eyes, our vision got gray. The word of God is still clear, black and white. And so it is that we used to have lots of things. But now if, if, if the individual was told, this is what we believe as a movement, do you accept? And then they say, yes, why all of a sudden are we reneging and now saying, oh, I don't believe that anymore. Oh, I don't want to accept. And all these other things. I'm not going to apologize to a Seventh-day Adventist when I use the writings of the prophet. I'm going to say, listen, she's a prophet of God. God has proven her gift. And then she passed all the tests of a prophet. I have no problem accepting her as a prophet because she passed the test of a prophet. Therefore, she is a prophet of God. She makes these things. It is not her that you're rejecting or accepting. You are rejecting or accepting the voice of God. Amen. I make no apologies for that when I'm talking to Seventh-day Adventists. If I'm dealing with a non-Adventist, I'm not going to talk about what Sister White said. They don't understand that yet. So I must be articulate in what the Bible says. I got to be able to walk them through the scriptures, which requires work. So, yes, you're going to have to go ahead and look at the verse. And if you see, man, that verse comes up 100 times, what you do is you take them in blocks and you say, I'm going to look at 25 today. I'll look at 25 tomorrow. I'll look at 25 the next day. And I'll look at the last 25 on this day. And praise God, I can say I looked at all these things and this is what the scripture says. Amen. And let me tell you something. 
There's nothing sweeter than when you know what you believe. When I think about how many people, I used to be a big follower of men, like many of us. I used to be a big follower of men. I quote the evangelists. I quote the preachers. I quote the favorite booklets. That, that's a trustworthy ministry in Adventism. I quote all that stuff. Now, I literally said, Father, I'm dumb. Teach me all over again. And literally, I go through every ver what? Why do I believe the state of the dead? Why do I believe tithe and offer? Why do I believe this? And you know what? When you do that, and that, that's my annual rule. Every year, I erase my mind and say, all right, where, where is it? I literally bought, I bought a Bible, and I said, I don't want to mark it up. I put, like, maybe a couple of verses in there. My old Bibles, oh, man, my Bibles look like a rainbow, just red, blue, green, green, yellow, everything, writing all over it. But then after a while, I said, look, the Bible says in Psalm 119, in verse 11, I've hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I said, Father, I want your word to be hidden in my mind. So I literally had to culture and discipline myself to stop writing in my Bible and just start saying, you got to remember it. You have to remember it. You got to remember it. If you're reading the Spirit of Prophecy quotes, remember it. Volume 581, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, 474. Da -da -da -da. It's like you got to remember it. Just try. Try, Dwayne. Tax your mind. And literally, that's how the Spirit of God has been speaking to me. So therefore, it's a discipline. But what I'm saying is that you can't be afraid to tax your mind. Don't always look for the easy way out, especially when you study Scripture. Because this is Satan's chief work to make sure you do not understand what God is saying in this book. Because everybody has an opinion. Yeah. Sister Hall, what was your thought, sis? My thought was on the uh, who died before sin. Yeah. Died before sin, yes. Okay, so you were just sharing, uh, okay, harmonious thought. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sis. We'll take this last one, and then we'll go ahead and go forward. We are going through a natural deterioration, even the healthiest of us. We're going through a natural deterioration every day because there's sin in the air. Once you breathe in, you're in trouble. You hear what I'm saying? Seriously. Thank God that God has, has fearfully and wonderfully made us. We have, purif we have natural purification systems. You know, we have all these wonderful things, but over time, we do age. We do age, and when you age, things naturally break down. So even though you're the healthiest of the healthy, it still doesn't mean that eventually a time will come where the body will not be in as great a shape as you were in your days of your youth. There's a natural deterioration that takes place. That's because of sin. That's because of sin. And that's why no matter what, we need the new heaven and the new earth. What I decided to do was say, when I get there, I'm going to ask Jesus. <laughs> no, really, because one, once one, I see it, I see it and I have a thought. Here's my thought. My thought does come from inspiration, which is this. Adam and Eve, when they existed on this earth, when you look at inspiration, Adam was approximately 18 feet tall and Eve about 15 feet tall. All right, when I go to my grave, or if I'm translated, I'm not going to be any taller than 5 feet 11, that, which, which is what I am right now. So therefore, I imagine that my partaking of the leaves that come from this tree is for not the healing necessarily from sickness, but the bringing me back to the original states of what God intended from the very beginning of time. Which, of course, maybe I'll get a chance to grow even taller. Maybe I'll grow my hair back. So it's like, I don't know. So therefore, there's some things that's going to remain a mystery, and when I get there, I'll figure it out. You know what I'm saying? But, therefore we, but we work with the evidence that God presents before us in the scripture. All right, so we understand precept, compare command with command. Once you compare command with command, then you want to see the magnification of it. What are the deeper layers that this command is telling me? What are the deeper layers that the commands of God are trying to bring across to my mind? Then I must compare line with line. I have to make sure that whatever I believe, whatever I practice, whatever I teach, it must be balanced and accurate. It should be something that the Christian in America can practice. It should be something that the Christian in Papua New Guinea can practice. Are you following that? It has to be balanced. It has to be accurate. That is imperative. Then, of course, you had here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. Now, here a little, there a little. 
you'll find is, is for the most part it is an echo of what we see with precepts and lines. Here a little, there a little. I did, did every research I could. I looked at Pioneer's writings. I looked at Ellen White's writings. I looked up the Hebrew and the Greek. I looked up everywhere. Where else is it in the Bible? It's the only place you'll find it in the Bible. So I was trying to figure out, well, what, what does here a little, there a little mean? So the first application of here a little, there a little is searching a little bit of scripture here to see what it says and then searching a little bit of scripture there to see what it says. When you have a good Bible, you want to make sure that you have what's called cross-references. That's a seriously important feature in a good Bible. If you're going to be Bible students, you want to have cross-references in your Bible. The reason you have cross-references in your Bible is so that you can follow the here, or there, here a little, there a little principle. Because if I read something in Matthew 5.48, I want to understand more. Well, what does God mean when he says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect? So I go to my cross-reference, and my cross-reference may give me four, five, six, seven other Bible verses that talk exactly what Matthew 5.48 was talking about. That's here a little, there a little. So I'm going here a little. Okay, it says this here. I'm going there a little. And it says it here. You know what? Here's the harmonious thought that God is trying to present to me. Are those the alphabets? The alphabets just simply deal with which part of the verse. Because sometimes you have a big verse. Maybe the verse has 20 letters in it. Or, I mean, 20 words in it. So what will happen is the first five words will have a letter A next to it. And then the next five words will have a letter B. So when you go to your cross-reference, what it's going to do is when it says A, it's talking about anything from A backwards in that verse. You get what I'm saying? If those first five words in that verse where it gets to such and such and such and such and such, A. Then I go to my cross-reference where it says A, and then it's going to give me other verses in the Bible that connect with those first five words up to A. Same thing with B, same thing with C, D, E, and whatever else goes on. Do you understand that? Exactly, like little clusters. So if it shows it, let me, you know, use a little pictorial here. So if I have, I'm just going to call that a word. That's a word, okay? So it's word, 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 and then A. Then word, 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 and then B. What happens is when I'm reading my Bible and it has those cross-references right there in the middle of the Bible, right? So it has those cross-references right there in the middle of the Bible. What it's going to do is it's going to show an A. And then it's going to give you, let's say, one, two, three, four verses. When it shows you those, all four of those verses is referring to right here. They're not referring to this. When it goes down and then it goes B, and then it goes verse, 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 then you know that B, verse, 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 is covering here. And so it is with C and D, and the list goes on. You get that? All right, so that's how you're studying your Bible. That's how you're going through. This empowers you when you're doing here a little, there a little. You'll be amazed at how that works to your advantage in a very marked manner. Yes, yes. This cross-reference is not that great. I've tried it before. This is let me see. Right, this is the easy right study let, let me get that girl. <laughs> now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a reason I don't have this anymore. Yeah, it's not bad. This is one of the poorest cross-reference Bibles that has been put together that my hands have ever touched. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that out. It is the Ellen G. White Bible. What it is, is it's the study Bible. Have you ever seen the study Bible where it has the Ellen White comments under it? Ellen White comments are great. The Ellen White comments are great. Cross-references, poor. Poor. Now, there's a reason I have this one. Because this one has been one of the best my hands have ever touched. This is the HMS Richards Study Bible. I love this Bible. I so love this Bible. I love this Bible because all those beautiful Bible studies in the back, I mean, HMS Richards was a powerful Bible student. Powerful Bible student. So first of all, I love the studies in the back. Secondly, absolutely masterful cross-references. I mean, the cross-references in here are just phenomenal. Very accurate. Very accurate. Oh, thank you very much. So therefore, that's what you want to consider. So these are little gems that you look for under the here a little, there a little. But watch this. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Let me show you another principle. Another principle. Uh, so. Yeah. Under here a little, there a little, you know. 
comparing scriptures with scriptures and use your cross referencing or you use cross referencing you, you you know in other words you can have now there is something called the Thompson chain Bible and the Thompson chain uh, reference Bible is a very good cross reference Bible I've looked through that I've never owned one of those but it looks almost more powerful than the one that I have Thompson chain reference Bible chain? Thompson chain reference Bible yes and then yes Cross-referencing. Okay, good. Thank you very much for that. Yes, sir. Scripture knowledge and use that. Scripture Never used it. Okay, so this is a software. Fantastic. So treasure, scripture, knowledge. I'm big on software. I'm, I'm very big on software, so that's a good one. Treasury of scripture knowledge. I'll look that up myself. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Were you going to share the N and the R in some Bibles too? N and R? N and R is under the same principle from what I've seen. In other words, uh, if the verse said, in, if you're looking at Matthew 23, 2, and then there's an R next to the wording, then same thing. In the cross-reference, you're looking for that R. Once you see that R, you know it's talking about that point where the R is in the verse. So it's the same principle. Same exact principle like what we were doing with the dots and everything. Same exact principle. Now, 1 Corinthians 2 teaches us something very powerful as well. And I thought that this was very interesting. Another principle in studying the Bible. This would, this would be an additional principle to hear a little, there a little. Let's add this as an additional principle to hear a little, there a little. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 2. And we're going to look at verse uh, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse things, 13. It says this, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the what? Holy, Holy Ghost teacheth. Now, stop right there. If we would have gone verse by verse through Isaiah 28, 9, you remember when it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Again, your homework assignment would be, who is the he? Now, who is it that teaches us? Holy, Holy Spirit, John 14, 26. So the Bible says that he, the Holy Spirit, is the one that teaches us, right? Yes. But now look at how the Holy Spirit teaches us in, in verse 13 as we continue. It says, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, and how does the Holy Ghost teach? Comparing spiritual with spiritual. So that's a very important point. Comparing spiritual with spiritual. Now, the reason why that becomes a very important principle is because you want to know where a lot of times Bible study is violated, proper Bible study? We do something different than what the Holy Spirit does. Go to Romans chapter 8. Look at this. Romans chapter 8. Yes. We're going to take a break in 10 minutes. Romans chapter 8. Spiritual with spiritual. But now look at this. Now look at God's uh, introduction to you and I about us. And I want you to see his commentary in Romans the 8th chapter. The Bible says in Romans the 8th chapter... It says this in verse 6, for to be what minded? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be what? Spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can they be. Now notice this. The Bible introduces to you and I that we have what kind of mind naturally? We have a carnal mind. Now, what God wants to do is when he teaches us, we, we must compare spiritual things with spiritual things, not spiritual things with carnal things. Do not make 
judgments on understanding the word of God or what is truth by comparing spiritual with carnal. Compare spiritual with spiritual. Spiritual points here, spiritual points there. Many a times people say, I cannot understand the Bible, I don't believe the Bible because it doesn't fit my ideology. It doesn't fit my understanding of truth. It does not make sense to me. Why would God go tell a nation to kill babies? That makes no sense to me. I don't believe the Bible. I reject it. You ever met people like that? Why would God do that? Why would God do that? And, and you know, the list goes on. How could God punish a man just because he wanted to touch an ark to keep it from falling off the animal and then God goes ahead and kills him? People say, that's not right. So they're, make, they're taking their own judgment, their own carnal way of judgment, and they're trying to judge spiritual things. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's okay to inquire. I call them reverent questions. It's okay to go to God with a reverent question. Father, why? Why do you allow that to happen? And you come humble. Remember we talked about that yesterday? You come humble, teachable, and you say, Lord, help me understand why was this allowed? to happen to this person? Why was this allowed to take place here? Why is it that you don't tell us all things? Humble, teachable, with a true willingness to say, Father, I want to understand. But when we begin to exalt our opinion and then say, you must succumb to my understanding, that literally perverts people's understanding of the Bible and sometimes it causes people to re reject. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 14 says, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. That's right. For they are foolish unto them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's right. How can we become spiritual? Instead of carnal, how can we not a natural man? I don't understand your question. Because it says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Right. If we continue to be natural man, we cannot receive the things of God. We're in agreement. So when do we become not natural? When the Spirit of God comes within us. Where does it say? So you want to know where? Will you go to John 3? John 3 and verse 5? John 3, 5? Yeah, where it talks about being born of the Spirit. Doesn't, is that good enough for you? And that's why I, I introduced Romans Galatians 8, 9. 20, I have Christ, Romans, 8, Romans 8, 9. <laughs> it says, <laughs> but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. That's right. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ. He's none of his. That's correct. We're in agreement. So when does it happen between justification and sanctification? If you're asking the question about when does a man receive the Spirit of God, that's what you're asking. When an individual accepts Christ and they recognize him as their only hope for salvation and they confess with their mouth and believe that heart, in their heart that Jesus is Lord, it is at that time they receive the Spirit of God. Baptism is a public declaration of something that already happened. So, Paul lay hands on the Ephesians for them to receive the gift of the Spirit. What is that? Okay, well, you seem to have a lot of Holy Spirit questions. Can we address that at a different time because you're taking us off from the focus? Because it's impossible for us, even though we go through your method, if we are not born again, if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, we still be natural... Brother Chin Lee, let me explain something to you. Number one, Brother Chin Lee, this is not my method. This is God's method. Everything that I'm sharing with you comes straight from God's word in proper context. What, what, hold on. Now, when we talk about being born again, we're talking about accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Yes? Brother Chin Lee, did we go over that yesterday? Did we talk about that with justification yesterday? Yes. 
In other words, what happened, Brother Chin Lee, is I made it clear that the majority of the class understood. It seems as if you were not satisfied with, with the answer. And that's why I'm saying that's okay. But it was brought across. I think the challenge is, is that it wasn't brought across satisfactory to you. And that's okay. We can talk about that. But would you agree, should we disrupt the class, go back to other studies that we did a day or two ago, cause everybody here to have to hold on until I answer it satisfactory to you, or do you think it would be a better idea to say, since I need to get some things clarified from two days ago or whatever, let me wait for the question and answer time? Or let me wait till maybe even after class, and I'll go ahead and understand that with Brother Lemon at a different time. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree. Thank you. All right, so we're back then to comparing spiritual with spiritual. God wants us to understand that we must not take carnal thoughts and make that the standard and then make God meet our carnal standards. You'll never understand scripture like that. There must be a teachable, humble spirit, a willingness to learn, to say, Lord, I am willing to surrender. I'm willing to surrender my carnal thought for your spiritual thought as you explain spiritual things to me. And by your power and your Holy Spirit, help me understand. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. All right, good. So what we're going to do is we're going to pause right here. These are some methods from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And what we're going to do is we're going to meditate on these things. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back with even more of what the Word of God shows us as it relates to the proper methods of Bible study that we may understand is true. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's take a break. Ten minutes. All right, let's have another word of prayer. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds uh, as we go forward in this study. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to study your word. We thank you, dear God, for the things that you're teaching us, and we just ask for even more of your spirit that he may come and that he may open our eyes and help us to behold wondrous things from your word. We thank you, dear God, that you are teaching us. We pray that you will help us to take these things to heart because it's our safeguard. If we learn how to understand these several methods that you teach us from your word, Father, we believe with all of our hearts that it will protect us, especially from the deceptions that come upon us in these last days. And so, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of Bible study. May we receive the word in our heart that we might not sin against thee. May it make us wise unto salvation. For this is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, another uh, method that we're going to look at as it relates to understanding principles of how to study the Bible is I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're looking at 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and we're going to look at a very important principle of how to study the Bible. There's several ways that God expresses his truth to us. We know it must be precept upon precept. It must be line upon line. It must be here a little. It must be there a little. Uh, we are learning also the importance of comparing spiritual with spiritual. Look at what one verse says that is, of course, led by the Spirit of God, and look at another verse where it is also led by the Spirit of God. And let us see how the Lord helps us to understand these things. We must be willing to surrender our carnal thoughts to receive spiritual, elevated, holy thoughts. This is a very important principle. But another one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you'll find that in verses 1 to 4, it talks about the children of Israel as they left Egypt and they were on their way to Canaan land. Uh, God brought them through the Red Sea and the Bible says that they were baptized and they were drinking of the spiritual rock which followed them and that rock was none other than Christ. You see that in verse 4. But then in verses 5 to 10, you find that the children of Israel fell into all sorts of gross apostasy and errors you know, very bad things that started to take place. They murmured, they complained, they committed fornication, and uh, they suffered the ramifications of it. But verse 11 is the key verse I want us to look at. In verse 11, you will find that the Bible says something here that I think is very important. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, it says, now how many of these things? 
Now it says, now all these things happen unto them. Who is the them? Okay, it's the children of Israel. It says, now all these things happen unto them for something. For what? And samples. Now what does the word in samples mean? Excellent. Excellent. The word and samples means types. Very good. It says, now all these things happen unto them for and samples, and they are written for whose admonition? Our admonition upon what? Whom the ends of the world are come. Who's that? That's us. So therefore, when we read this verse, think about it. From verses 1 to 4, children of Israel leaving Egypt, pressing towards Canaan land. From verses 5 to 10, it goes through several experiences that they had. Then in verse 11, God kind of summarizes it by saying, now all of this, all of this happened unto them for in samples, types. Now every type needs what? An anti-type. So therefore, another method that we learn is something called typology. Typology. That's another method of Bible study. It's called typology. Typology is very, very powerful because typology helps us see that there are things that happen in the Bible that are not only old stories, but it's actually present truth. Let me give you an example of this. The, what, what does Egypt represent? What does Egypt represent? Babylon? Babylon? Hmm. World, okay. What does the Bible call Egypt in Exodus 20? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So what does Egypt represent? Bondage. Now go to the book of John 8. When you go to the book of John, the 8th chapter, John, the 8th chapter, And when you look at John 8, what does it say in verse 32? Well, you look at verse 31, really. Verse 31 gives some good context. John 8, 31. And you find in John the 8th chapter in the 31st verse, Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then what's going to happen? You are my disciples indeed. And then you shall know the truth. And what's the truth going to do? It's going to make you free. Now, in verse 33, they respond back to him. They say, hey, we're Abraham's seed. We've never been in. You see that word they use? Mm -hmm. So Jesus was talking about freedom, and they immediately said, well, he's saying that we're in bondage. So therefore, they said, well, we're the children of Israel, so let's go ahead and tell them who we are and where we're at. So they said, look, we've never been in bondage to any man, but now look at how Jesus clarifies on verse 34, where he says what to them? Say unto you, sin is the servant. You know another word for servant? bondmen. So therefore, while Egypt equals bondage, the Bible also shows sin equals bondage. The same way Christ wanted to deliver them from Egypt is the same way God wants to deliver us from bondage. And so it is that when they were delivered from Egypt, they were heading somewhere. Where were they going? They were going to the promised land. What was that called? Canaan. Canaan. Are we heading to the heavenly Canaan? Yes. Definitely. So you could see that the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, bondage. God brings us out of sin, bondage. And then they were on their way to an earthly Canaan. We are on our way to a heavenly Canaan. And so the Bible says that the experiences from Egypt to Canaan land that the children of Israel had were types. That means then that when I study the Old Testament and I read of the several stories that took place as the children of Israel left Egypt on their way to Canaan land, that's not past truth. Now I understand that as present truth. Because the experiences that they went through, we see that in an anti-type manner, we are also going to walk in the same type of experiences. You following that? 
So therefore, typology becomes something very important for you and I to understand. I'm going to just put that circle here. Typology. Typology is very, very powerful. Look at this quote here as we consider uh, inspiration. It says, the history of the wilderness life of God's chosen people was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God till when? The close of time. So do you see that? What they went through in their wilderness life, it says, was something that was of a benefit for the Israel of God till the close of time. It says, the apostle says, now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says, the Lord did not forsake his people in their wanderings through the wilderness, but many of them forsook the Lord. Do you see that? So what does that tell us about the last days? That many of us will also do what? Forsake the Lord. Even though God did not what? Forsake us. God didn't forsake us. God was always there, arms outstretched. But the problem is, is we are in many respects like Israel. Did Israel um, get tired of Moses? Did they get tired of Moses? Who was Moses? Moses was what? Moses was, no, 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 no. You said it right. Moses was what? Moses was a prophet. And they got to a point that they got tired of hearing instructions from the prophet. Are there people today that get tired of hearing instructions from the prophet? Israel, did they get to a point at one time where they started to sing, swing, and celebrate because Moses delayed his coming down from the mount? Huh? In these last days of earth's history, do we see many of the Israel of God today singing, swinging, and celebrating because the Lord has delayed his coming? Did Israel even say, I am so tired of this manna? I'm tired of this healthy food. I want the good old flesh pots of Egypt. Did Israel do that? Do we see people today saying, man, I miss those golden arches. Man, I miss that KFC. Killing folks continually. <laughs> miss it. Killing folks continually. So you see that? You see how people can forget? And so you'll find that, look at what it says. It says, the education they had had in Egypt made them subject to temptation, to idolatry, and to licentiousness. And because they disregarded the commandments of the Lord, nearly all the adults who left Egypt were overthrown in the wilderness, but their children were permitted to enter Canaan. Isn't that something? So we find that typology, it, it becomes something that, that helps us, it teaches us lessons. So when you study the Bible, you want to look for where do we see typology? Where do we see typology taking place? Where can we see examples of what was happening amongst the people of God there, and we can see it as a type of what's going to happen in these last moments of earth's history? What was the last, what was the last entrapment of the devil? that uh, took Israel when they were right at the bank of the Jordan. They were committing whoredom with the daughters of Moab. You find that in Numbers 25, verses 1 to 3. And so it is that when they were right at the border of Canaan land, all of a sudden, it was like Satan gave his final death blow, if you would. And it happened to involve women. And so you'll find that in these last moments of earth's history, when we hear about brilliant stars sometimes that begin to go down as a result of subjecting themselves to sexual sin. I'm disappointed, I'm hurt, but I'm not surprised. You understand that? We have never seen so much sexual promiscuity taking place in the Seventh-day Adventist church. See, the world is already swallowed up in this stuff. You can look at the billboards, you can listen to the music. I mean, the world is swallowed up. There's a reason that in Galatians 5, in verse 19, when it talks about the works of the flesh, the first four all deal with sexual sin. God just uses different language, lasciviousness, licentiousness, adultery, and so all talking about sexual sin. Sexual sin is the sin of the day. It is a sin that many individuals are falling into, and even some of the greatest uh, preachers and teachers and so on, un unfolding one by one, is coming out of the closet. And all of a sudden, we're hearing all these horrible stories now of what's taking place, of how some of God's warriors have fallen to the, uh, the issue of sexual sin. So when we look at it from, and you'll see later on, in fact, I'll save it for later, because right now I'm dealing with what we're going to call the literal application. 
The literal application of a text is that we're looking at it, they fell into sexual sin, so that was a type, so we know that as we draw closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, that means that many of God's people are going to fall into the trap of sexual sin. Does that make sense? You see that? That's, that's, a, that's a type, anti-type. And so it is with several things that you can do. You can study it out, type, anti-type, type, anti-type, type, anti-type. Anti and you can just constantly see it flowing. Typology helps us see these things so we can know where we are in prophecy. When we begin to see certain events taking place in the world and in the church, you've got to look through both lenses. When you want to understand prophecy right, you don't just want to look through one view. You don't want to just look at what's happening in the world. You must pay attention to what's happening in the church. When you see what's happening in the church, that lets you know how close is close. So therefore, we see that typology becomes a very, very powerful, powerful method of Bible study. Learn to study in types. Don't make things types that are not types. Don't make things types. Oh, Jesus found, uh, you know, Peter found money and fish, so everybody's going to start going by the beaches and start grabbing all these fish and sticking their hands down their mouth <laughs> trying to find cash. You know, don't do that. Don't pervert the method. Don't pervert the method. Be faithful to the method. Not everything is a type as we like to sometimes do it. You see, and again, that goes back to line upon line, balanced and accurate. But now, look at this. When you think about types, there were several types that were spoken of in the spirit of prophecy, but you can see them in the Bible as well. Um, I put up the spirit of prophecy quotes where you see the tree of life. The tree of life, did you know it was a type of Jesus? Yeah. Tree of life was a type of Christ. You read that in manuscript, release 17, page 352. Now, again, these are just the spirit of prophecy quotes. There are methods we could do it with Bible study, but it would take longer for the class time that we have. So I just put up the spirit of prophecy quotes here. Uh, another type was the manna. The manna was a type of Christ. Remember, manna represents bread. And Jesus talked about himself as the manna in John chapter 6. You can read that in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 297. So you'll see that there are lots of things that are spoken of in typology format. Uh, you also look at Elijah. He was a type of the last day people. Elijah was definitely a type of God's last day people. Prophets and Kings 2.27 shows us that. Then in addition to that, you also had Canaan. Canaan was, of course, a type of heaven. And as Canaan was a type of heaven, you have Signs of the Times, March 24th, 1900, paragraph 1. So you see all of these different things that are spoken of as different types, and they were very powerful. The Jewish tabernacle of the Christian church. The sanctuary, the Jewish tabernacle of the Christian church uh, was a type, uh, a type rather, of the Christian church. The Jewish tabernacle was a type of the Christian church. You read that in Signs of the Times, February 14th, 1900. And so you'll find that there's all these different ways that you can study. So when you're looking at the tree of life, you can say, wow, that represents something else. There was a, the tree of life was a type of what Christ himself was to us. Christ was our life. You remember Deuteronomy chapter 30? In verse 20, where God, well, Deuteronomy 30 in verse 19, God says, I set before you life and death, bless, blessings and cursings. And then God says, choose life. Then in verse 20, God says, I am your life. So what was God really telling us to choose? Yeah. Him. You get it? So therefore, the tree of life was a type of none other than God, Jesus, who is our life. You get that? So therefore, that's how you do a faithful typology. But then there can be false typologies. And that's what we, we talked about that. We can take certain things and say it represents this under all circumstances. But then we know that if we do that, sometimes we can fall short and we'll find other scriptures that clearly show that it does not represent that in every case. So that's how you got to be faithful with the Bible. Make sure the type has a true anti-type and you'll work fine with it. This is type and anti-type. Another one. Another one we're going to look at is first and second applications. First and second applications. Yes, the wilderness. The wilderness is the, the wilderness. We also see it as the world or life. You know, the world or life. You know what we go through day by day in our journey. The wilderness was a rough road. Now the wilderness was supposed to be a quick road. Remember that. Hold on, it take a few days to get there. But unfortunately, it took them 40 years. So you know what I'm saying? So, so it is that, you know, we, we could have been giving God thanks in heaven right now, or at least in the new earth. But it's only because of our choices that we find something else, unfortunately, had to take place. 
Well, let's go to the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. In fact, uh, go to Malachi 4 first. Malachi 4. In Malachi chapter 4, let's notice something the Bible says here. In Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, this is a, a very, very good and, and simple lesson as it relates to um, first and second application of Scripture. And you'll see that this is very helpful. In Malachi 4, 5 and 6, notice what the Bible says. It says, Behold, I will send you who? Elijah, Elijah the prophet. Now, where was Elijah when this was stated? Dead. Dead? No. Dead? Oh, no, 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 no. Translated. Translated. <laughs> so, where, where was Elijah? So Elijah's in heaven, right? But now look at this. He says, I'm behold, I'm going to send you who? Elijah. Is Elijah going to come down from heaven? No. So it says, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so you'll find now that here's a prophecy. This is a prophecy that Elijah was going to come, right? But you will find that this prophecy is a perfect example of first and second application. First and second application. This is a, this is a perfect example of this. How do we know that? Because go to the book of Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we must see a fulfillment. Watch this. In Luke, the first chapter, we find that the Bible tells us something here that I believe is very, very plain to us. Luke chapter 1. That's right. Now, when we go to Luke chapter 1, let's look at verse 13. It says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name what? John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Did you notice that? What is he doing? He's turning who? The children to the Lord their God. What's another term for God? Our Father. So here goes John. His mission is to turn the children to the Father. You see that? Was that a work of Elijah, the pro this prophecy in Malachi 4? But then look how it spells it out in verse 17 even more clearly. It says, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. And another term for Elias is Elijah. And so it says to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So first application is that John the Baptist is a fulfillment of that prophecy. John the Baptist would be a first application of that prophecy because Elijah is already gone. Elijah is in heaven. He's there. So now, here goes Malachi presenting a future prophecy of what's going to take place. And the first application of the fulfillment of that prophecy was through John the Baptist. But then we find that Malachi said, but before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, that wasn't represented by the first advent. The first advent of Christ was not the great dreadful day of the Lord. So therefore, that means that there must also be a what? There must be a second application. There must be a second application to this text. So therefore, when we look at that, we can begin to see that John's work is definitely our work. The work of John the Baptist is our work. Central Advance, April 8th, 1903. Then you consider what is our work? The same as that given to John the Baptist. Volume 8 of the Testimony to the Church, page 9. So we find that John's work is our work. Now, now look at John's work. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, very quickly. In Matthew chapter 3, we find that John's work was very, very simple. It was made very plain what God had called him to do. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3, 
It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So here goes John. He's giving a crying message. He's preaching the gospel. Matthew chapter 3. And verses 1 to 3. Verse 3 is really a key verse, but nevertheless, verses 1 to 3. John the Baptist is giving a crying message, and he's calling the people, prepare ye the way of the Lord. All right? But then we go ahead and we look at, as John was giving a gospel message, and that gospel message was calling people to repentance and preparing, so it is that we find in Revelation 14. In Revelation the 14th chapter, in verse 6, we find that John the Revelator, He's also showing a group in the last days. And that group is going around telling everyone, preaching the everlasting what? Gospel. Gospel. Saying to them that dwell upon the earth. And he goes on through the three angels' messages. Those three angels' messages. Is it a call to repentance? Yeah. Yeah. Is the three angels' message a crying message? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a message that is flying swiftly? Yeah. Definitely. So we can find that there's a match between the work of John the Baptist and his message, and we can see the work of our message. Our message is a call to people out of sin. How in the world can you tell everybody that the hour of his judgment has come without calling them to prepare to stand true to God in that judgment? You follow that? So therefore, we see that the work of John the Baptist is none other than the work of God's people. John the Baptist was preparing the world for the first advent. We are preparing the world for the second advent. It's a perfect parallel. The same way John was calling everyone back to the Father in true worship, so it is that we call everyone back to the Father in true worship. That's why it says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So you'll find that there's a parallel between John's work and our work. This is an idea of the principle and the concept of first and second application. How about when Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation? What was Jesus talking about when he, when he, when he said that? In Matthew 24 and verse 15. He was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Is that right? Matthew 24 and verse 15. He talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. When did that take place? That took place in A.D. 70 or 70 A.D. But is there another destruction that is coming? There is another destruction that is coming, but this time it's going to be what? The whole, world. the whole world. So therefore, again, you can see that when you study Matthew 24, you can see, well, there's a literal or first application, which applies to A.D. 70. But then when I read Great Controversy, page 30. And you can read the whole chapter in Great Controversy under the destruction of Jerusalem. But it's in page 30 that we find that it is none other than the world that is made the equal to that which represented Jerusalem. And the same way that Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, so it is that the world is about to be destroyed. So you have in the Bible what's called first and second applications. So when you study the scripture, what you want to do is stay faithful to the text. Now this, this is a serious issue. Because what happens is a lot of times people, when they study the Bible, they'll read all sorts of things and they add to it what they want. They say, oh, this means that. That means this. But you know the best way to understand scripture? What did it mean in its local, literal application? That's the first thing you want to do. What did it mean when it was stated there? Because once you can understand it here, then you can understand it there. Is there a lot of talk right now about the latter rain? What's the best way to understand the latter rain? Understand the former rain. Great Controversy, page 611 and 612 says, As the former rain fell, so shall the latter fall. So when I look at the prerequisites that God gave for how the former rain would fall, I can see, wow, that's the same prerequisites that God wants for the latter rain to fall. So therefore, you start making the connections. So therefore, when somebody says, Hey, did you know the latter rain started falling since September 11, 2001? Then I can say, hmm, what makes you say that? Let me give you an example. Go to the book, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm sorry, John chapter 17. That's it. John 17. John chapter 17. When you go to John, the 17th chapter... 
Let's notice something. I'd like for someone to read for us John 17, and we're going to go ahead and look at verse 4. John 17 and verse 4. Who would read that for us, please? John 17 and verse 4. Now, what did Jesus say he did with God? Glorified. He says, I have glorified you. Now, is this what Jesus did while he was in his earthly ministry? Yes. So then how do you explain this? Last night we had some questions about glorifying God. Is that right? We had some thoughts about giving God glory, things of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. Go to John chapter 7. Tell me if this doesn't appear strange. Jesus just said, I have done it. I have glorified thee in the earth. That's what he said, right? Now, look at this one. This I thought was very interesting. And, 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 I, and, and see, these are the kind of questions that I'm going to ask you in your practicums. In John chapter 7, verse 38, well, verse 37. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood in Christ, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of waters. Now look at verse 39. It says in verse 39, but this spake he of what? Of the spirit which they that believe on him, what? Should receive, watch this, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, why? All right, folks, explain, explain. How could Jesus say in John 17, I have glorified thee on the earth? But then the Bible says the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The question is, when was he glorified? When was he glorified? When he went to the Mosul, 1844, huh? He had to wait that long to be glorified? When was he glorified? Right, so, but how, how did he glorify the Father, but yet he himself didn't receive glory? Like, how would you explain that so that somebody could get a clear picture? And that's, that's not glory for him. You don't see that as glory for him. Okay. Okay. Yes. Don't touch me yet. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Now, what I like is we're all thinking. This is good. Very good. I have glorified thee on the earth. Now, are we called to fear God and give him glory? Yes. So are you saying that when we give God glory that, uh, you know, we're just praising him, but... Like, I, wanna, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the thought process. Jesus is to be glorified, yes? yes. But we don't know exactly when that happened just yet. We're kind of guessing at it, which is okay. But we look at John 17, and we just see that when he says, I have glorified thee, that that's just dealing with the Father, but not anything he did. Right. I just want to make sure I'm understanding your thought process. So it was what he did? 
but it didn't give him any glory. So if he and his father are one, then why can't he get glory if he glorified the father? Okay, 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 okay. Very good. So that means you found your answer just by reading the next verse. <laughs> now, now watch this. We're going to build on what's called contextual reading. But hold on. When was Jesus glorified? Because somebody might look at verse 5 and say, And now, O Father, glorify thou me. So did he do it right there? Did the Father do it right there? No. So when did he do it? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, or Hebrews chapter 5. What about John 17, 22? Mm-hmm. Where God said, or where he says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, did you see that? The glory which thou gavest me, I have given. So that means he had could create a little confusion. Would you agree? Yeah. All right. Go to Hebrews 5. When was Christ glorified? Christ was glorified when we look at Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 5. In Hebrews 5, 1 to 5, it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Now look at verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but, notice that but, but who? He. But he that said what? Unto him. Unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So we find then, what, what is the context of what we're reading about so far? About Christ being glorified, but, but what's the connection of Christ being glorified? You see, we've moved on now, and what we're doing is our next phase, which is called contextual reading. We're doing contextual reading. Verses before, verses after. Compare the verse with the verse. Understand the context. What's being discussed in Hebrews 5? Aha! That's it. Did you catch that? Say that again. Christ being appointed as what? High. High priest. Who was the person that was used as the model? Aaron. Aaron. Did you see that? Aaron. So therefore, in other words, Jesus never glorified himself, but it was when something took place, when he became what? Our high priest. Then he was glorified. When did that happen? When did that happen? Resurrection? Not exactly. Most holy place? I sure hope it didn't take that long. When he ascended, but was it when he immediately ascended? Wait a minute. Hey, hey, let me make it easy for you. What was the fruit of him being glorified? The Holy Ghost would be given. That's why I gave you John 7. The Holy Ghost, when he was, when was the Holy Ghost given? What was that day called? Pentecost. It was when Jesus was inaugurated as high priest. 
And when the Spirit of God fell down upon the disciples, and when they began to preach the word with power and so on, it was at that time that Jesus was indeed glorified. Amen. Did Jesus glorify God on the earth? Was he lifted up also? Sure he was. Sure he was. He didn't do it himself, but he was lifted up. But it was when he was inaugurated as high priest. That's when he was glorified by those on the earth. Acts City Apostles, page 38. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified. Man, what page is that again? Exodus Apostles, page 38. Even, which, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. Was Jesus' glory seen at the Mount of Transfiguration? Yes. Matthew 17. You see, we can glorify God today. If somebody came to you and said, hey, brother, why don't you go ahead and smoke some cigarettes? And let's say you used to smoke. They say, hey, brother, why don't you go ahead and smoke some cigarettes? He says, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I I've, I've, I've given that up. I've realized that my body's a temple, so on and so forth. Did he glorify God? Yes. Amen. He glorified God. But one week later, the brother comes back. Hey, man, why don't you have some cigarettes? And let's say you were stressed out that day. And all of a sudden you say, you know what? Man, give me that thing. And you just go ahead and you start smoking away. You start smoking away. Now, whatever glory you gave to God last week is gone now. So we can give God glory in certain spurts. But there comes a time where God says, one day I'm going to light this earth up with my glory. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, we're told that a time is going to come where the same ones who are beholding that three angels' messages are going to be so filled with God's presence that they're going to literally light up the world with God's glory, and that light won't go out. That's the level of glorification that we are looking forward to, to be a part of. And that comes when God has a sanctified people first. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's right. Revelation 18, 1 through 5. And so you'll find, watch this now, so you'll find that contextual reading helps us a lot. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to do another one with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's do this quick. We have ourselves about 10 minutes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You'll find that context is very, very imperative, very, very important when it comes to studying scripture. Uh, my father died August 6, 2011. And when he died, uh, my mother, we, gave, we, had a, we, had, we did her service at a Seventh-day Adventist church. My mother looked at me as her preacher. That's how she referred to me as, you're my minister. So uh, she gave me the right to go ahead and arrange all these things for her when she passed in 2007. Well, in 2011, my father was very close to my sister. My sister was an angel to my father. She really was. Um, she was not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I guarantee you, she loved the Lord for whatever she knew about him. That's why I firmly understand when God says, come out of her, my people. God has people in those other churches. Believe that. Well, here it is that she um, ministered to dad. So when dad died, she took charge of that. So we went to her church. It was a, for the most part, they worshiped just like Pentecostals, but nevertheless, they call themselves non-denominational. Well, when I was there, I found it to be very interesting the minister said, I went up and I told everybody that my father is sleeping and that when Christ comes, uh, you know, the trump will sound and by the grace of God, dad is going to rise and so on. Well, the minister comes up behind me and gives his sermon and he absolutely tries to destroy everything I just said. And he says that my when Jesus comes back the second time, my father is going to come with him. Did you hear that? Now, I was like, that's got to be the strangest thing I've ever heard. So 
I emailed him afterwards. He gave me his card. I emailed the pastor. I said, help me understand this. I said, you just said, you said such and such and such. Um, I said, what scripture do you have for that? He took me to 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's notice what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, it says, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's the verse he gave me. He said, God will bring with him. So he says, see, so when Jesus comes, God is going to bring those who died with him, which means they must have ascended before that. I read the verses too, but he said, but the Bible says they will come with him. How do you explain? They were sleeping in heaven? <laughs> You see, here's the, here's the thing. Always picture, always picture it like a situation of sword fighting. You see, if somebody says 1 Thessalonians 4.14, when, when you think about sword fighting, you think about those guys that go click, 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 and they kind of do this back and forth thing. Now, when you think about this, sometimes people will do this sword fighting thing. Don't get caught up in sword fighting. In other words, somebody says 1 Thessalonians 4.14. We say, ha, ha, ha. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. They say, okay. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. And then we say, all right. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6. And they say, okay, that's good. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're not moving until you take the text out of their hand. So perhaps a wiser way to study with people is deal with the text they're using. Deal with the text they're using. Because what happens is, if you keep beating around all the texts and you're just putting up every other verse under the sun, but you're not dealing with that verse, they're just going to keep holding on to it tighter, tighter, and tighter, and they're going to cherish that verse even more. Because you never touch that verse. The best way to beat a sword fight? Click, 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 pow! Knock the sword out their hand. Take that sword away can't use it anymore. And if you can take that sword away and they can't use it anymore, now you can go ahead and finish up with all the other verses later on. You get that? Mm -hmm. So therefore, let's look at the verse carefully. Read it slow. Can I say something to you? What about verse 16? And we're going to go to verse 16. We're going to go there. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> now look at this. In verse 14, look at the verse. There's two words in there that should clear the whole verse up. Look at what it says. For if we believe, watch this, that Jesus did two things. What were the two things? Died. He died and what else? So Paul is making it clear two things happened to Jesus, not one. Is that right? He's saying that he what? Died and rose again. So Paul is making the point that Jesus died and rose again. After he makes that point, what's those next two words? Even so. Even so. What's the last experience of Jesus? He rose again. So here it is. Paul is now saying, even so, just like Jesus, just like Jesus, it says, them also which sleep. What is sleep equivalent to? Died. And then it says, sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. What does the bring with him mean then? Rise again. Do you see that? So I told the minister, I said, Minister, I think I know what the challenge is. You got your ascent and your descents mixed up. That's what he did. He got his ascent and descent mixed up. He's thinking that the text is saying that when God comes in the descent, that he's bringing the saints with him. But the verse is actually showing that on the ascent, Christ is bringing the saints with him. That comes from contextual reading. You get that? You got to look carefully at the verse. You got to zoom in on the verse and say, wait a minute, what is the text talking about? What is the subject matter? What is it saying? What is the point that Paul is trying to bring out? That's how you study the scripture. I'm telling you, if you can learn this, you will be saved from a thousand perils. I am serious because there is so much fanaticism that is in the world and in the church. 
And you're going to find that if we're going to see God give us victory, you've got to learn contextual reading. You've got to learn how to read the verse. Look at the verse itself. What is it saying? What is that? Look at every word. You think Jesus was joking when he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word? When you read verses, brothers and sisters, you've got to look at every word and say, hmm, what does that mean? Got it. Hmm, what does that mean? Got it. Hmm, what does that mean? Got it. And you keep locking it in so that way when you read the verse, you can say, this is all the verse is saying. He sent back a whole bunch of things. We're actually still in a dialogue right now. Nice man. Nice man. And I told him, I said, I appreciate you dialoguing with me. I told him that. I said, I really do, because he's actually a very popular minister. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I said, I appreciate you taking the time to dialogue with me. I said, one day I'd like to come and visit you and have dinner. These people, many of these people are absolutely beautiful people. I mean, they really are. They really are. They have a genuine love for God, and sometimes they put us to shame. They really do. They have a genuine love and belief. It's just that they... They, they have captured on to some things that are erroneous. And they're just waiting for a little more light to shine. Amen. Well, contextual reading is imperative. And then let's go ahead and do our last one here. Our last one we're going to do is called life lessons. In, in, in our uh, life lessons, you'll find that that's another thing with studying the Bible. In studying the Bible, you'll get life lessons. Let me give you an example. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Life lessons. Nice, beautiful uh, life lessons. I think these things make some great points here. Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 23. Proverbs 4. Verse 23. Yeah, Proverbs 4.23. Now, you know, this principle here, you want to really be mindful of it because... Um, I could see how this can be very abused if we're not careful. So let's watch this. Now, Proverbs 4 and verse 23, let's look at it. The Bible says, keep what? Keep thine heart with all what? Diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Question, what does the heart represent? The mind, right? The mind. So the heart represents the mind. So Solomon is warning us. He's saying, keep, what does the word keep mean? Guard. Guard. Very good. Man, that makes me happy when you pull the right ones out. Guard. That's exactly what the word keeps. That's why I love Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that guard the commandments of God. Guardians. Guarding the integrity of our Father when the rest of the world is trying to paint a certain picture about him. God's character being vindicated. Those who guard God's commandments. Well, here it is that the Bible says, guard your mind with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, does that make sense? Yeah. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Look at what Ellen White did. You read Adventist Home, page 16. And Adventist Home, I want to pull this one up. You've got to read this. This is incredible. There's a, there's a, a certain way to study called exegesis. Um, they use this, you know, theological term. And exegesis typically is known as the critical study of a text. You know, you, you really look at the text and you're looking at the text. What is the text saying? And you're being very faithful to the text. It's called exegesis. Um, but I want you to think about this. What was it talking about? Guard, dil guard your mind with all diligence, right? Look at what it says here. In Adventist home, page 15, I apologize, I said 16. 16 is just a continuum, but it's really 15 that I want to give you. Can I read? Page 15? No, uh, 1, 5. All right, you there? It says this. Society is composed of families and is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Now, where's that from? Proverbs 4.23. She says, out of the heart are the issues of life. And the heart of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. You see that? Now, if I just look straight, naked, pure, exegetically, at Proverbs 4.23, I would have said, perhaps Ellen White 
is not studying the Bible right. Because there's nothing in that verse that talks about the household. Is that right? There's nothing in the verse. But when you pull a life lesson from the verse, you could say, wow, this life lesson right here perfectly matches with the verse and takes nothing away from the verse. The same way Solomon says, guard your mind with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard the mind, because out of the mind are the things that come that can affect life. So it is that guard the household, because whatever comes out of the household can affect the lives of people. Same, it is a completely harmonious principle. You see that? So it's a life lesson. So even though the text directly may not have been talking about the household per se, we can pull a direct life lesson from that text that is 100% faithful to the text. Yes. Adventist on page 15, paragraph 1. And so you'll find that there are several life lessons. How about when Jesus says, the wheat and the tares? You ever thought about that? Why? You ever ask yourself, why does God want wheat and tares to grow together? I'm closing on this point. Why does God want wheat and tares to grow together? Okay. Anything? Now, think about it. I, when I read the text, didn't they say, we see weeds? We see tares? So I think that tares are identifiable. Because they, they said, we see them. They saw wheat, but they saw tares. They said, we see tares. So I don't think that it was the identification issue, really. Not, at least not to a very large degree. I do understand that people can prejudge. But, you know, by their fruit you shall know them. Why do you think that he wants tares? and wheat to grow together. Yes, and then we'll take this final comment. Well, I think because it's not about seeing, it's about they grow close together, and if you pull the root, uh, it may affect the root of the wheat. So it will be uh, pulled up together. Okay, I'm going to build on your point, though. But same thing? Okay, now watch this. Yes, Sister Hall. For refining of character. For refining of character. Now, watch this. What kind of language is Jesus using in the parable of the wheat and tares? What kind of language is he using? Very good. He's using agricultural language, right? Wheat represents good grain. Tares represent what? Bad grain, not necessarily. Tares represent something else. Weeds. You actually look up the word tear in the Greek. It means weeds. Now watch this. Well, yeah, I guess so. Okay, I'll work with that. Now watch this. What are one of the key reasons that weeds grow? Because they have good soil. Oh, no, soil that's lacking. Aha, very good. Anybody who does gardening knows that one of the reasons weeds grow is because the soil is deficient in something. What does God equate the soil to? The heart. the heart. Is it possible that you can look at your soil in a farm, but when you see weeds grow, you realize, oh, my soil might be lacking in phosphate, potassium. Maybe there's some cornmeal I need to put in here. Maybe there's something, cottonseed meal. Maybe there's something I need to add to it. Those weeds can be an indicator of what is wrong with your soil. Did you get that? So what about the part where he said that somebody went in there and sowed those weeds? I don't have any problem with that. I believe Satan sowed some people in the church. Now, I don't have any problem with that. But the question is, why? And the reality is, is that God has allowed, not ordained. I'm going to show you this final quote. I'm letting you go. God has allowed tears to come into the church because sometimes it's when we come in contact with someone who behaves like a tear <laughs> that we really begin to see the true condition of the soil of our own hearts. You know, when I'm around a bunch of wheat-like people, you know, wheat meetings, <laughs> when, you go to the, when you go to the wheat meetings, and everybody's on the same page. We all believe sanctuary. We all believe victory over sin. We all believe spirit of prophecy. Oh, man, that's a wheat meeting. 
Everybody's just praying with each other. You know, wheat. You never have to ask questions. What, is there any vinegar in this? Is there any chocolate in it? You don't have to ask any of those questions. It's a wheat meeting. But then when you get around people who say, there is no sanctuary, you believe that foolishness? When people begin to say, spirit of prophecy, that woman, I wish I could take all her writings and burn them. You know there's ministers who have said that from the pulpit in the south where I live? There are ministers who have actually said, I wish we could take all our books and just burn them. Now here's what happens. When I hear somebody say something like that, the question is, is right there God says, now I'm going to zoom in on your heart. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Are you like Moses where you're saying, Lord, look at these apostates. Lord, I can't even imagine life without them. Father, if you can't save them, take my name out of the book of life. Do you have that kind of love for apostates? Or do we have that kind of feeling like John when he said, Lord, there goes the Samaritans, call down fire from heaven and burn them right there. You know how many of us are like that? You can pull some serious life lessons when you study the scriptures. Things that the text is saying, and you can pull a life lesson. I say, man, I you know, look at that life lesson that we've just learned here. And this is a means of how God wants to teach us. We are told God will arouse his people. God's going to arouse his people. It says, if other means fail, what's God going to allow to come in? Heresies. heresies. You mean to tell me that God allowed heresies to come into his church? Yeah. Yep. It says God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. The Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Precious light has come, appropriate for this time. It is Bible truth showing the perils that are right upon us. This light should, be, should lead us to a diligent study of the scriptures and a most critical examination of the positions which we hold. You see that? Very, very key. God would have all the bearings and positions of truth thoroughly and perseveringly searched with prayer and fasting. Believers are not to rest in suppositions and ill-defined ideas of what constitutes the truth. Their faith must be firmly founded upon the word of God so that when the testing time shall come, and they are brought before councils to answer for their faith, they may be able to give a reason for the hope that is in them with two things. You remember that text? 1 Peter 3.15. So we've learned that God actually allows heresy to come in. God allows it. It's part of his plan. Didn't ordain it, but he's working through the, with the situation. And he's going to shake up the house of Israel. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And by the grace of God, if we apply all these principles we've learned, contextual study, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, typology, understanding first and second applications, and all these blessed experiences, brothers and sisters, there's no reason that we should be shaken up and tripped up by the enemy through all these whelms and winds of doctrine and fanaticisms that we see taking place. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Yes, my sister. Beautiful point. Yes, in the hand in the back. Um, one of the biggest things I learned during this Bible study part is um, letting go of the thought. There's a, there's a text in the Bible that says, don't argue with one another. Don't, I guess it's cool. And so with that, I just, usually just shut down and say, okay, they want to argue. And I say, nothing. And I step back. And then I said, okay, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Okay, 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 let's talk about you don't have to be argumentative. I've, I've corrected people with a big smile on my face. And so when they say meekness and fear, it, fear means respect, right? We're going to explain fear. We're going to break down fear. Oh, I can't wait for that one. All right. So thank God. Did we learn something? Yes. Was it helpful? Yes. So let's take these principles, apply them in our lives, and let's receive the blessings. Amen? Amen. Last question, and we're going to close with prayer. Okay. Um, what can we work on? Like, is there any texts or any scriptures that chapters that we can work on until Sunday? Oh, <laughs> until Sunday, no. What I would recommend, quite honestly, focus on, review these principles you've gone over. 
Review them. Just keep reviewing them. Because on Sunday, we're going to have several hours. We're actually going to take a period of up to three hours of doing just practicums. You're going to take everything that you've learned all this week, and we're going to have you put it into practice on Sunday. Sunday is going to be a very, very exciting day. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning on the dot. Nine o'clock. <laughs> Amen. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to make a closing point here. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for the things that you have blessed us to study. We thank you, dear God, for the principles that we're learning from your word. Lord, we just ask that you will please continually give us wisdom, even beyond our years. And Lord, we thank you for the methods that you have taught us, that your spirit has governed. And Lord, we thank you that we can now take these principles and exercise them in our lives and may it truly prove itself to be a safeguard. And Father, I ask that your blessings ultimately will be with us that as we faithfully study the scriptures through these methods, may we search the scriptures, and in them may we receive eternal life, for they truly are they which testify of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.